he'd got in the middle of the lane, and I meh, stopped him at full draw, and, and I shot him. It was a 154-inch 10-point. But with, with the without the saddle, there's no way I would have done that. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, episode number 209. John Eberhardt, saddle hunting high-pressure bucks. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, the Horny Buck Seed Company, Covert Scouting Cameras, and Morse's Sporting Goods. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Adam Hayes from Team 200 and TheMoonGuide.com, and you're about to push play on one of my favorite podcasts, Big Buck Registry. This is Brian Hardy from Hardy Face Paint, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, The Big Buck Registry. Hi, my name is Joe Donito. I'm one of the Adirondack trackers at adktrackers.com, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry. Hello, fellow predators. My name is Jay, and for Dusty Phillips, Jim Keller, and the entire staff at the Big Buck Registry, I'd like to say thank you for tuning in. Hope you're having a fantastic day. I know I am, because you're over there on the other side of this audio device listening and tuning in to some of the best deer hunting advice and tips and strategies that we can deliver as we talk to amazing deer hunters from all across the country and sometimes across the world. If you're a newbie, and you're just tuning in for the first time, I'd like to say thank you for finding us. I think you'll find our entire catalog extremely helpful and worthy and world-class. So if you'd like, go back through our entire catalog. I'm sure you'll find something that is relative to your style hunting where you live somewhere in the country. If you're returning and you're a loyal, diehard listener, thank you so much. I cannot thank you for the number of downloads we get on this show It blows my mind and it humbles me. I am so psyched that we have the audience that we do and that you enjoy deer hunting as much as we do here at the Big Buck Registry. This week's guest will not disappoint. John Eberhardt will be coming up in just a little bit and we're going to talk all about saddle hunting. I'm going to give you a little rundown on who John Eberhardt is if you've never heard of him. But rest assured, he is one of those top-notch deer hunters that lots of other deer hunters try to model themselves after or have read his book a long time ago, and to this day they credit him with much of their success. We are still running our harness program. However, we're completely out of them. All of them are spoken for. We have a couple left to ship. So if you have purchased a tree stand recently and you're not going to use the harness that it comes with and you would like to help another hunter somewhere in the country, we're running an exchange program, you send it to us, we'll send it out to that hunter or we'll at least get you the name and address of that hunter who is in need of a harness. So if you'd like to participate in either way, whether you'd like to receive them or contribute them, just shoot us an email, j or dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. Now, John Eberhart is a Michigan resident, and he has been hunting the Michigan deer woods for 53 years. He has 30 bucks in the Michigan record books that John says were taken from 19 different properties in 10 different counties. John prefers public land hunts, and he enjoys knocking on doors to get permission to hunt on private land. He's been on 21 out-of-state hunts and has taken 19 Pope and Young bucks on 13 properties in five states. As you can see, John gets around and does so effectively with success. So how does he do that? Well, first of all, John is a skilled woodsman. John says his key to success is his saddle hunting apparatus and how he uses it. This was once known as the tree sling. By popular demand, we listen to our listeners. And we are dedicating this episode to tree harness saddle hunting. And John Eberhardt is the perfect hunter to explain this technique. I would highly recommend you pull out your notepad now. In fact, I would say it's required. So we'll turn to John's interview in just a second. But first, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. 
For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, Breadcrumb designs the first trackable Bluetooth knock and location marker. This story was originally featured on the Wide Open Spaces website and was reported by Justin Hoffman. Introducing the Bluetooth knock and location marker, the first of their kind to hit the hunting market. With a trackable Bluetooth knock, you'll never play hide-and-seek with an arrow again. Providing both a brilliant light and sound, these innovative knocks will communicate directly with your smartphone with a range of up to 100 yards. Each replaceable battery provides more than 35 hours of tracking power, which is more than enough to get you through the multiple seasons. A tiny PCB processor runs the show on the knock by controlling the light, sound, and Bluetooth tracking functions. Best of all, it's 100% waterproof. It's easy to lose sight of such things as stands, trail cams, or gear when you're out on hunts. The new trackable location markers by Breadcrumb will make that a thing of the past. The compact and durable molded case is easy to attach to gear or stands with a powerful microprocessor contained within that allows you to track locations through a mobile app on your smartphone. This app gives you the option to activate light beacons, up to five ultralight LEDs, as well as the sound beacon when your things are simply out of sight. The Bluetooth technology is designed to track location upwards of 150 yards away. The location markers are built tough to stand up in the harshest of conditions and use two AAA batteries as a power source. The company is currently taking pre-orders for this product at a discounted price, so be the first to receive these innovative items. Wildlife Rehabilitator Taking Care of Smallest Deer Ever This story was originally featured on the WBTV Channel 3 website and was reported by Steve Ornassage. Nancy Wisenant has been a licensed wildlife rehabilitator in North Carolina for more than two decades. She has cared for everything from bunnies to bear cubs to deer. She is called on by wildlife resource officers when wild animals are killed on a highway or elsewhere and their babies are left behind. Last week, a call came in from Asheville stating that a fawn needed to be taken care of. Though she has done it hundreds of times before, this case is different. The fawn is the smallest she has ever seen, she said. Most newborn deer are in the six-pound range. This female fawn was less than three pounds. Wisenut says in the week that she had had it, the fawn's prognosis has improved markedly. It was thin and full of maggots when she got it, but now the tiny deer is eating and thriving. Wisenut says that this is the busiest time of year for cases like this, and she wants to remind people that unless they are experts with a license in wildlife rehabilitation, taking care of an animal, like a fawn, is illegal. She also says most people do not have the training or proper food for the animal and could, in fact, kill it when trying to take care of it. Anyone who comes across a young wild animal should call a North Carolina Wildlife Resource Officer or their state wildlife agency. They will determine if the animal needs the special care that a specialist can provide. In many cases, nothing has happened to the mother and she will be back. In the cases like a bear cub being found, it can actually be dangerous to get near them because it could provoke the mother to attack. Union files grievance over goats mowing on Western Michigan's campus. This story was featured on the MLive.com website, written by Brad Devereaux. New hungry workers at Western Michigan University's campus have drawn a union grievance. After a half-acre trial run in 2016, Western Michigan University hired a team of goats this summer to clear 15 wooded acres on campus. Goats consume 3 to 5 pounds of vegetation per day, according to rental company Munchers on Hooves, LLC, and they leave behind natural fertilizer. But the natural mowers have not impressed everyone. A statement written in a newsletter indicates a grievance was filed relating to the subcontracting and the use of goats. WMU horticulturalist Nicholas Gooch said the language provided to him came from the July 17, 2017 Chief Steward Report newsletter written by Kathy Babbitt, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Local 1668 Chief Steward. I also filed a grievance as it relates to subcontracting and the use of goats, which was not reported to the local union, and again, we have people on layoff. This was indicated in a copy of the newsletter Gooch provided to the Kalamazoo Gazette. Calls placed and messages left for the union officials were not returned this week. Kind of wonder if anyone is going to sue the deer on Staten Island since they are also clearing away vegetation. Guess we'll find out. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. Special thanks again to my son, Ben, for some of the stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thank you to Jim Keller with the Deer News. And without further ado, here is John Eberhardt. 
John Eberhardt, welcome to the Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well. How's Jay? <laughs> Jay's doing good, man. I'm talking to you. It can't be a bad day start, starting out like that, right? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I'm tired. Been in trees the last two days, <laughs> so my body's a little on the worn out side. Why doesn't it surprise me that you're hanging out in trees? Uh, I'm getting ready to do these new whitetail workshops. I typically yeah. don't do anything in the woods this time of year, but uh, I'm prepping for my in-field workshop days. Oh, cool. Very nice. We'll, we'll have to get get uh, some more information on that as we go through this our talk. This sounds pretty interesting. John, tell me about yourself. Where did you grow up? And tell me about some of your influences as a younger person uh, relative to hunting. Well, I grew up in southern Michigan. Wasn't a lot of deer down there. I didn't really have any influences in deer hunting. Nobody nobody in my family hunted. Nobody owned any property. I don't know how I got into it, really. I walked by an archery shop one day, and there was people inside shooting, and I walked in, and I was just a kid, and I just thought it looked cool, and I picked it up, and I just, I just got into shooting bows, and then I just got into bow hunting. So I didn't really have a mentor. Okay. Everything I've done has been self-taught. Okay. All right. And and that's sometimes that's the answer. You know, we we ask that same question of a lot of interviewees and sometimes there is somebody, but a lot of times there's you're self taught too. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Being a self taught hunter is an advantage because anytime you grow up in a hunting family, you're typically being mentored by an uncle or a dad or a sibling and basically you're learning pretty generic methods. Mm-hmm. You know, because most old school hunting methods are relatively the same so in my opinion when you're doing everything and you're self-taught you advance a little faster because you're a little more open to to new ideas and you know it, it you learn from your mistakes basically and right. you don't do the same things all the time not uh not forming any bad habits because of your teacher that may have bad habits themselves yeah exactly and, and if it i wouldn't say a bad habit it's just that when you do something and it's wrong you learn from it and you do something else. Uh, whereas typically if you're hunting with family, even if you do something wrong, you continue doing the same thing wrong because that's what they did. And that's what they'll probably continue to tell you. Well, that was just a mishap. You know, you, mm. you just got to keep doing it that way. Cause that's the way they've done it all their lives. Right. Gotcha. When you were growing up and when you were introduced to the bow, what kind of bow was it that you were introduced to? It was a Ben Pearson recurve was my first bow. Uh, 62 inch, 40 pound. Gotcha. Yeah, it was real long and relatively straight, actually. Huh. Even though it was a recurve. No kidding. What really? what, what were some of the the first mistakes that you taught yourself? Like, what were some of the things that you bumped into? You said, "Well, I won't do that again." Uh, <laughs> learning how to shoot. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Right. As far as mistakes, entry and exit routes, timing, daily timing, seasonal timing. Um, you know, saving my best locations for the rut phases, learning how to hunt the wind back then. Now I don't pay attention to the wind whatsoever, but back then, you know, learning, learning how to hunt the wind was just a huge, huge deal because you you were always making mistakes. And the only way you can learn from your mistakes when you're, you know, getting winded is by getting winded basically. And then learning how to adjust, you know, Mm. I, I got to the point where I wouldn't hunt saddles or sides of ridges because of the, you know, wind currents or swirling winds. So, you know, uh, that was probably the biggest thing is learning how to hunt the wind. Okay. That's, that's When I paid attention to the wind, I don't pay attention to wind anymore. You don't? No. All right, let's put a pin in that. I want to come back to that subject for sure. That's that's a interesting topic. We don't get that a lot. But that's some people have, but it depends on the style of hunting. But this is an interesting topic because you're still in trees, right? Uh, correct. Well, I, I, hunt, I hunt on the ground once in a while okay. when the situation calls for okay. it. Let's talk about the, the saddle hunting concepts. The You've been known more or less as the saddle hunter guy. And mm-hmm. I'm curious to learn about how you started in in that. Like What, what drew you to that that method in the first place? And then let's go through some of the techniques and, and styles and strategies that make it okay. successful for you? Well, it was 1981, and I saw this thing called a tree sling. Hmm. And it was just this harness system. And, you know, back then, tree stands were terrible. Climbers were death traps. And I bought one of these things, and it was very uncomfortable. But I could see I could see the potential in it if I learned how to use it. And uh, so I just... 
I did. I took took about three years, and I finally learned how to use it correctly, and you know, it just opened up a whole new avenue of hunting. Okay. Can you describe it for us as to what it looks like? Uh, it's just like seat seat belt fabric. Yeah. And you're sitting in it. You're sitting in a, a seat belt seat, basically, and you're tethered to the tree. So you're facing the tree, and you can swing around the tree and shoot any direction at any time. You got steps around the tree all at the same level, so you can walk around the tree. Gotcha. And this this apparatus was more... Tra- <laughs> That's a good term. That's a good term for it, an apparatus. An apparatus. Yeah. It's an apparatus. What, what drew you to that over the, the tree stand back then? Uh, it's light. doesn't weigh anything. Hmm. Uh, it's fabric, so it never creaks. Um, I could carry it in my backpack. It rolls up about the size of a softball. Yeah. Um, I could prep 50 trees and hunt out of all the trees with the same sling, so I didn't have to have 50 tree stands. I didn't have to worry about somebody stealing it because I hunted public land. Um, <laughs> the mobility... I could shoot 360 around any tree, which you can't do with the tree stand. Uh, cumbersome, you know, tree stands are cumbersome to carry. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, <laughs> just unlimited things. You could also, you know, when you get a non-targeted deer come through, you could use the tree as a blocker. You could swing around the tree and keep the tree between you and the deer, right. so they didn't pick you. And you can hunt higher because it's so safe; you can't fall out of it. Uh, the more you use it, the more I used it, the more I tended to get up higher, so I was out of deer's peripheral vision okay how do you get up into the stand is it a, a, like stick method tree steps. tree steps okay tree steps spikes or you could use climbing sticks Climb. the same things that you'd use to get up into a, a conventional hang on okay all right so it's the same concept and yeah. what once you get up there what what is it that you're hanging and how, how does the seat attach to the tree Okay, there's a lead strap, and it's probably eh, seven or eight feet long, and it wraps around the tree, and then it ties to itself. And then it's it's basically coming down to the front of you. There's a strap in front of in front of where you're actually in front of the seat itself. It's called the bridge strap, okay. and it actually connects the two sides of the seat. And and then from the bridge strap on either side, there's just a like a double web of seatbelt fabric. So you're actually sitting. Remember the old chairs that had the webbing in it? You know, the crisscross webbing? Sure, yeah. It's, it's kind of like that, except it's, a, you know, it's relatively narrow. But you can adjust it. You can open it up to fit your butt, if you will. You know, so you can adjust the depth of the seat. You know, you can have one side come up up and uh, onto your lower back and the other, the other piece down into your thigh, or you can have it where it's just cradling your butt. Uh, not to sound ridiculous, but... You know, I I keep it when I'm sitting in it. I have one. The bottom part of the strap is just basically right at the bottom of my butt cheeks, and then the top part of the strap is about at the top of my butt, below, which would be below where a belt would be if I'm wearing pants. Hmm. So it's just cradling my butt. Okay. Now this apparatus that we're talking about is from 1981. Is this the same item that's out there today? No, <laughs> no, okay. this, the old sling was, uh, it had no safety features on it whatsoever. Mm. So there is no way if that were still on the market that, that you could get liability insurance on it. So, you know, anything nowadays, it pretty much has to be TMA approved. So it has to have a pi- five point hitch, you know, it has to have shoulder straps and leg straps. So it would never be able to be sold today, but, uh, that's still what I use. You know, I've used the saddle. And now the new thing on the market's the it's called the new tribe arrow hunter evolution. Okay. And it's it, it it they function in the exact same manner. They just have a lot more safety features on them. Okay. All which right. I would if I owned one of these newer ones and hunted out of them, I'd cut all that stuff off personally. That's what I would personally do. It'd kill your warranty and your liability insurance on you know, from the company. But uh, as far as a comfort level that I would take all that stuff off. Okay. Mine's very basic. It literally rolls up the size of a softball. It seems like a huge advantage if you just wanted to pop in and pop out on any old tree. It seems like that could... There is... Let me put this in perspective. If if there were two hunters and they were exactly the same skill set as far as hunting ability, mm-hmm. and one... And they hunted the same property for five years, and one hunter used the harness that I'm talking about... Mm-hmm. And the other hunter could get all of the tree stands or climbers or ladder stands he wanted for free. And they so one guy hunted out of a harness and the other guy could hunt out of whatever conventional stand he wants. 
and they could set up as many trees on the property as they wanted. Uh, the guy in the sling would crush the guy in a five-year time frame. The advantages are that huge. Hmm. What are wouldn't the, even be close. What are the advantages in that scenario? The 360-degree mobility. Mm-hmm. You hunt higher. It's not cumbersome. You know, I get a crack. I get a kick out of watching TV where these guys are carrying their climbers down a nice, pristine two-track. Well, if you hunt public land in a pressured area, or if you're hunting private land in a heavily pressured area where there's 10, 20-acre parcels and everybody's hunting on them, you don't walk down two tracks to go hunting. you got to get in the crap. So, you know, you, that totally, uh, most of the trees that I hunt, there's no way you're going to carry a climber to it. It ain't going to happen. And a bow and a backpack. It's just too much stuff. So you got to be mobile. Uh, also, you you know you can carry some steps with you. You know, you carry fifteen or twenty steps, get you up any tree. But most of my trees are pre-prepped. But you, once you get up in your tree, again, you can use the tree as a blocker. You don't have your body profile sticking out on the side of the tree. So when the leaves are down during the rut phases, you get picked all the time. And you can shoot three hundred sixty degrees around any tree. Uh, it's much, much more comfortable once you get used to it. And there's the, there's just a, a boatload of advantages, just tons. Hmm. Very interesting. You can hunt a leaning belt. You can hunt trees that lean. Right. And tree diameters are not an issue. I can I can hunt a flat wall if I wanted to. If I, right. if I can climb it, I can hunt it. Right. And I can hunt trees that are six inches in diameter if I want to. I've shot deer out of trees that were six inches in diameter. You know, trees that are right. too small for climbers or hang-ons. Right. I mean, it seems like the most versatile hunting item that you could have that that isn't a tree. The, the Obviously, the fixed, fixed position ladder stands, you're kind of locked in, and you get a hope that the deer don't change their pattern because that's there or because you're there. Because that, that, yeah. then it's a pain in the neck to, to move the ladder. Those things don't move through the woods particularly easily. Well, not only right? that. I mean... You know, a ladder, it's intrusive for one thing. Mm -hmm. And ladder stands are typically, typically most guys are hunting out of 16 to maybe 18, 20 foot ladder stands. You know, it's rare I hunt below 25 feet to my feet. So, you know, I'm getting above what a ladder stand can get. And I, I honestly can't fathom when the rut's going on and all the foliage is down, a mature buck coming through the woods and you know all the trees are grayish colored and here's this black framed big cumbersome ladder there and, and a deer not focusing his attention on the on that ladder i mean right. it seems like their visual would just be drawn to it right so you know that's another disadvantage and plus the the setup of ladders and and you ha- how many of them you have to have i i go into every season with probably 40 trees prepared and i can walk to any tree and hunt any one at any point in time because they're all prepped. They've got either steps in them or spikes, or, you know, I carry steps with me if I know I'm going to hunt a specific location and it doesn't have steps in it. So the, the advantage of just the mobility as far as when you're in the tree, moving around the tree and going to any tree and setting up at any time without the concern of theft, uh, it's it's huge. <laughs> it's right. just huge. But it it takes getting used to. I mean, if I would have bought that sling... And I hunted in it once or twice, and it, like I said before, it was very uncomfortable. If I would have just said, nah, that's too uncomfortable, you know, this hang on is a lot more comfortable because I'm used to it. And just giving up on it, uh, I guarantee 50% of the bucks I have on my wall would not be dead. Somebody else probably would have shot them. It's been that big of it, it's, it's, it's helped me kill at least half of the deer I've, I've killed, the mature bucks I've killed since I've had that. I probably would not have killed had I had to use some sort of a conventional stand. It's that big of a deal. Right. I always thought that for a while that the the climber might be the most versatile until I got more accustomed to the the hang-on. At least the hang-on is similar in that you can go to pretty much any tree and you're not not limited by a straight tree with very limited branches, which you need for the climber. But this, this is as versatile as... The hang on, except that it's lighter. So in a lot of ways, it's even easier to carry. Yeah, yeah. Most hang on. I mean, a light hang on is like seven pounds. You know, right. and plus they're cumbersome. They have a frame. They have a solid frame, so they are cumbersome. Right. This, these are straps. You know, they fit in your backpack. And the new tribe, I think, 
is around four pounds, if I'm not mistaken. Again, I help them design that, but I don't personally use it. But it, it's considerably lighter than a conventional hang-on. Plus, you know, it rolls up into a small piece that you can put in your backpack. And again, you don't have to worry about creaking. There's no snow or ice that can build up on it, you know, in the winter. So right. you've got any, anything crunching on it. Um, there's just, just you, you don't have to climb up and hang it. I mean, to, for me to have 40 trees prepped, I can't even fathom owning, owning 40 trees in. Right. Yeah. I can hunt any one of my 40 trees, and I've only had one of these slings in, since 1981. Right. I'm still hunting out of the same one. Okay. Must be a heck of a durable item. I mean, it's it's that seat, well, it's seat, seat, seat belt material. Fabric. Right. That stuff yes, is. It's a 3,000 pound test. It's, it's, it's amazing stuff. You, you, like, yeah. We'll use it for uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's it's that good. Like, you can use it for repairs on, on all kinds of items, or if you want. Like I've even used it for repairs on coolers, you know, for the straps mm-hmm. on the back. That it's it's, uh, it's incredibly durable. Well, seat belts designed in cars to stop you on a hundred mile an hour crash, no matter how much you weigh. So, right. Yeah, I think it's going to support dead weight in a tree. Right. <laughs> and the tree saddle back when the tree saddle was made, that was ninety six hundred pound test. That was a lot heavier fabric than even seat belt material. Right. Okay. And um, when they when TMA tested uh, that 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 was the safest thing they ever tested. They actually put I think it was a 275 pound log and tethered the saddle tethered that or had that braced in the actual seat of the saddle and then tethered the lead strap and I think they let it free fall six feet and it stopped it in a tree stand. There isn't a tree stand made that the tree stand wouldn't have buckled. Gotcha. Okay. Now the 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 item that you use is different than what's available on the market today. Correct. And you said that there's a bit of a uncomfortable factor involved in the beginning. Can you describe in more detail what that felt like when you first got into it, and then what made you decide to keep going with it, even despite the uncomfortable aspects of it, or completely foreign or different? feel than what anything else that was on the market at the time yeah well the the main thing that was uncomfortable is i was used to tree stands i mean and i when i first started hunting tree stands that didn't weren't even around i i sat on oak branches and in maple crotches and stuff like that so but then tree stands came out and i was using tree stands and it wasn't I, i'm not gonna say it wasn't as comfortable as a tree stand it was just different you know, tree stands were my comfort level because I'd hunted out of them for a few years, since probably 1975 or 76, somewhere in there. And then I get this thing, and I go up, and I tethered to it, and I was leaning leaning back too far. And upper, in other words, my upper body was leaning, was not parallel with the tree. It was actually leaning backwards, so it was hard on my back. Mm. And when I learned how to tether it properly to the tree, I started tethering it lower where I could lean my upper body forward, then it became extremely comfortable. And also when you get up there the first couple times and you tether to the tree and then you let go, you're like, you know, you're 25 feet off the ground and you're letting go of the tree and all you're sitting in is a little strap. So it's just a weird feeling. It's just Mm -hmm. different. And uh, once you get used to it, like I don't even think about falling anymore. I don't think anybody has ever fell from a saddle or a harness type system. I don't think there's anything on record where anybody has fell because the fabric broke or you, you literally, once you're tethered into it, you literally can't fall out of it mm. once you're hooked up. Okay. And, and they all come with a, a safety climbing strap. So basically, you know, you're tethered to the tree if you so desire with a safety climbing strap from the moment you leave the ground till the moment you get back on the ground. So the way they're designed is you climb the tree with the safety belt attached. Then once you get up to your hunting location, then you tether the lead strap. And then once your lead strap's tethered, then you disattach the safety belt and put it back in its pocket and hunt. And then once you get ready to get down, you put the safety belt back around the tree disattach your lead strap and then go down with the safety belt tethered. So you're, you're tethered all the time if you're doing it per the instructions. So, um, but originally I just seen the advantages. I've always been the type of guy that's been pretty dedicated and I have a desire to succeed. So I always looked forward. And even though 
it wasn't comfortable. I, I could see, I could foresee the advantages, the huge advantages of weight and prepping so many trees in the 360 degrees and using the tree as a blocker. Uh, I could see so many advantages that I was like, I've got to learn how to use this thing. So, so what I'm using is basically a hybrid. I've taken some parts from the trophy line tree saddle and incorporated it onto the old tree sling. And I've, I've, basically came up with a hybrid that you could never ever sell it on the market because there's no safety features but that's personally what i use and the one that new tribe makes now you know it's the same functionality it hooks up the same and it has all the safety features for climbing and stuff um it's just not as uh it it's just got more straps on it basically because because of the safety features you know the shoulder harnesses and the leg straps okay What's the learning? But that's all stuff that if a person did want to, they could alter. Right. And it has a lot of adjustment straps, too. Uh, The new tribe has waist adjustment straps. It has thigh adjustment straps. So it's probably a little more comfortable than what I'm hunting from. It's very comfortable, the new tribe. Um, But if I were to use a new tribe, what I would probably do is I'd get those straps all adjusted where they needed to be. And then I would cut off all the buckles and just permanently stitch it. So, so I had less buckles and less straps hanging off. It okay. would just be solid straps. Okay. And why would you why would you remove them? Just because you don't want all that other stuff hanging around? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty adept at I work out every night uh, and I'm I try to stay in pretty good shape, so I'm real good at climbing trees and so I, I don't really hack on wood worry about <laughs> falling while I'm climbing up trees and okay. getting in and out of them. Is, is, what's the learning curve? I mean, how long does it take somebody to get to use it? If somebody bought a new tribe and they called me, uh, probably a day. If they went by the instructions, maybe never. Hmm. Because the instructions on the trophy line saddle, which is no longer made, and the new tribe, they show you to hook the lead up really high. Like when you're standing on your pegs that you have around the tree, you know, because cause you, put, you put pegs or tree steps around the tree where you're hunting, you know, at your hunting location. So depending on the diameter of the tree, that depends how many steps. I like to keep my steps about eight inches apart. So if I'm hunting an 18-inch diameter tree, I might have four or five steps around it. If I'm hunting a four-foot diameter tree, I may have eight steps around it. If I'm hunting a six-inch diameter tree, I may have three steps around it. So, so basically, when you're standing on your steps, you're standing upright and you're hooking up your lead, they always tell you to hook it up as high as you can reach. Well, when you hook it up really high and then you put your weight in it, basically your lead is right in your face. You're hanging almost straight down. So what I do is I, I hook my lead up a lot lower. I put it at about eye level. And that way, when I'm in the sitting position, the lead's coming down at a 45 from the tree instead of almost straight down in front of my face. Mm. That way, when it's coming at a 45, I can lean forward, so I'm taking all the pressure off my back. And I, I actually, because I get in my tree so early before daylight, so as not to spook anything with my entries, yep. there's lots of times I'll wrap my arms around the lead strap and lay my head on the lead and, you know, not off for an hour before it gets daylight. <laughs> gotcha. I do that all the time, actually. Okay. All right. When, can you describe for me... The entry to the tree or the tree that you're looking for. And and then once you find that tree based off of whatever you describe, what's the setup? Like, how are you methodically going through getting up to where you want to go? And what what type of pieces are you attaching to the tree? Well, what I, that's, a, that's another unique, I'm glad you actually said that, because that's another unique feature about hunting out of a harness is, you know, a lot of times on tree stands and especially with climbers, you have you might find a, an awesome destination spot like let's say an apple tree or a white oak tree, um, and there's not a tree within shooting distance of the destination spot that will work for what you're hunting from. So you may have to back off and hunt on a runway feeding that destination spot, which takes a lot of other routes going to that des- destination spot out of your wheelhouse shooting distance. So that's the unique thing about the harness is it's pretty rare that any tree will not accept a harness and you can hunt. You, so it opens up a lot more trees as far as what you can hunt from. Okay. Like I said, leaning trees, big diameter trees, skinny trees, 
Um, and then as far as when I get to a tree and I prep it and, and keep in mind, most of my trees are prepped during post season. You know, all my stuff, all my like locations are typically done by the end of April. Hmm. So I'm prepping them. If it's a private parcel that I've got free permission properties, because all I hunt is free permission and public land. I've never paid a ton anywhere. I've never owned anything. Okay. So if I, if the farmer lets me, you know, if it's kind of a scrappy tree, like a, maybe a maple or something like that. And he'll let me use like three eighths inch pole barn spikes. I'll put spikes in the tree cause they're cheaper and I'll take a three eighths, you know, a cordless drill with a three eighths bed and drill a hole and put tap the spikes in it. So I'll, I'll pre set the tree with all my spikes at the top as well. And so they're ready. Now, if I'm freelancing, the biggest buck I ever killed was 180 incher and I was freelancing. I basically had a fanny pack with 20 steps in it below my backpack. And then I also have a safety belt in there. So I found the tree I wanted and it was, and it was around noonish. And I basically swung the fanny pack around to the front. And as I'm going up the tree, I'm putting in the steps and I shot that 180 incher at about four o'clock. And that was at a primary scrape area. Okay. It's pretty rare that I freelance out of state. I do. When I'm, you know, going on a state hunt, but in Michigan, it's extremely rare that I freelance. It's typically on a preset tree. Okay. So I may, I may set up, I may have 40 trees prepped, you know, and a lot of them obviously were prepped from previous years. I may set up five, eight new locations a year because I lose property all the time, lose and get property. Um, but I may have 40 locations and I may only hunt eight of them in a, in a year, eight or 10 or maybe 12. You know, if I set up at an apple tree or a white oak tree in postseason, I have no clue if it's going to have fruit or mast. So I have to do a speed tour just prior to season to see if it actually produced apples or acorns, and that will dictate whether I hunt it that year or not. Okay. All right. So you're you found the tree, and it sounds like you pre prep for for some locations. And you say uh-huh. you're doing it post season. That's when. You, you feel the best time is to, to prep your trees? Oh, without a doubt. Because okay. because in Michigan, pretty much all the northern states, you know, 60, 60 plus percent of all P&Y bucks from every state, and in all the books I've written, those stats are in it. I researched all these stats. 60 plus percent of the bucks are taken during the rub phases. So the leaves are down during the rub phases. So during postseason, I'm not only looking at the rut sign left from the previous season, you know, like scrapes and utilized licking branches and rub lines. I can identify last fall's rubs from rubs a year and a half ago. And the scrapes are still visible because there hasn't been any green up yet to cover them up. Mm-hmm. So postseason, yeah, I can go in and I'm looking at the location. I'm looking at the trees exactly the way they're going to look with no leaves on them during the rut phases. So that will tell me how high I may have to go up higher than I would if I were prepping that tree during preseason. You went in preseason, everything looks thick. You got leaves and you're like, ah, I can get away with hunting that high. Well, then you go back and hunt it during the rut and you stick out like a sore thumb. I, I, I don't do any preseason scouting or location preparation whatsoever. Ever. Okay. So you're doing all postseason scouting and preparation. Yeah. And it's because you're looking at the area as far as you, you can actually see how dense the security cover actually is for a mature buck to feel comfortable moving through where when you do that during preseason everything looks dense you can go to an area and prep something preseason and then go back there during the rut and it's like oh my god this doesn't look anything like it did when i set it up there was a lot of foliage now it's mature bucks probably not going to come through here because there's not enough security cover Hmm. so you're looking at everything the way it's going to look when you typically go back and kill your better bucks you know during the rut phases Okay. So let's say you're not freelancing and you don't have ladder sticks with you at this time. You've pre-prepped the tree post-season and you're getting ready. I don't use ladder sticks, by the way. Okay. Not at all. I use all screw-in steps. I, I've, I've got a boatload of sticks that people, companies have sent me, but I don't use them. You don't use them. So anyway, okay. no. So you, your primary mode of moving up the tree is a, a pre-done tree and, and their steps that you're using. Okay. Yeah, either spikes or screw in steps. Yes. Okay. So you've pre prepped the tree. What's in your pack that you're bringing with you, other than your bow? What's in the pack that you're bringing oh to the God. tree? And what do you get to the top? When you get to the top of the steps, what's what? What do you start doing? Is is there? A, what's the prep system? I guess is what I'm trying oh, to figure okay. out. Oh, okay. At the base of the tree, yeah. I'll take my sling. 
out of my backpack because it's carried. I carry it in my backpack. Okay. It takes up very little space, and I'll wrap it around. I'll put it on around my waist, and then I'll kind of swing the lead strap around my waist and tuck it in. And then I climb the tree. I put my backpack back okay. on. I hook my rope to the, my bow to the rope. I climb up the tree, and then when I get up to the top where my steps are, my ring of steps are around the tree, I'll typically pop off my backpack and put it on a hanger because I already have a hanger off to the side someplace for my backpack. And then I'll just pull the lead strap out from where I tucked it in, unwrap it around my waist, and I'll I'll hook the lead strap up to the tree and pull my rope up and put it on a bow hanger, and I'm done. Okay. So you're, you've literally prepped this all the way, even with the foot, the foot braces. So oh, when it's prepped, it's got bow hangers in it. I've got a backpack hanger. I've got a quiver adapter. The quiver adapter I carry in my backpack. I actually screw that into the tree once I pull the bow up and put the bow on the hanger. Yeah. So, yeah, everything, all, all the bow hangers are in the tree. Uh, all the steps are in the tree. Yeah, it's it's ready to go. Okay. So the, the only thing that's left is the harness. That's it. And that, that's it. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. And that's on me. Okay. And that's always, that's with me 100% of the time. There are, there have been occasions in the past, and I haven't done it much lately, where I will, if I go in on an evening hunt and I liked what I saw, but I didn't see a shooter, and I, you know, but there's, I'm at a scrape barrier or an apple tree or a, a oak with acorns on the ground, and I want to hunt there again in the morning, you know, I'll just slither out of this strap and I'll just leave my bow hanging there and get down, and that, that way I, it'll, force me to get my butt out of bed and be there in the morning gotcha okay all right so what is in your backpack what else do you bring with you i carry an inhale and an exhale grunt call two grunt calls i carry obviously a folding saw i carry a rattle bag i carry three flashlights i carry my layering garments i carry antihistamines in case i've got a little bit of a cold or a runny nose i take antihistamines to dry me up I carry a uh, Quaker Boy bleat and heat can, which I don't use very often. Um, I carry, obviously, a bow rope in case the bow rope that's in the tree is cut by a squirrel or a rodent. Um, I carry a water bottle. I carry a pea bottle, um, a quiver adapter, a couple quiver adapters, a couple tabs. I don't shoot a release. I still shoot fingers, so I carry a couple of calf-eyed tabs, um, a range finder. And some just other extra bow hangers in case I get up there and I need to put a bow hanger someplace else. You know, a lot of times when I prep a tree and I've never hunted it yet and I get up there to hunt it, I realize, hey, I need to have a bow hanger over here too. So I'll I'll always have half a dozen extra bow hangers in my fanny pack, which is inside my backpack. Okay. The, The harness itself, once you have it attached, is it? Universal. I mean, let me let me back up a little bit. Could you could you use this harness for gun hunting? Could you use it for all kinds of archery hunting? Ab- absolutely. Longbows, gun. Yeah. Back when I did gun hunt, I shot deer out of my harness for sure. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so it, it in fact it's it's awesome. It's more awesome for a gun gun hunting than a hang on because you're facing the tree. So when you want to shoot at something, you just put the gun up against the tree, you got a solid rest. You just cup your, you know, your left hand, if you're right handed around the stock to the tree and, you know, just move around the tree, however you need to be. And you got a nice solid hard rest. Okay. That's cool. I mean, it's nice to have a little, little solid rest there for, for gun hunting. Absolutely. You're and the, so the way this gets set up when you're bow hunting, it's fine for traditional bow. It's fine for compound bow by the sounds of it. And when you actually take the shot, do you have to lean one way or the other in order to to get around the side of the tree? And is there any obstruction there, or any kind of anything you have to think about when you're taking that shot? None. No. Typically, typically, just like you would with a tree stand or a ladder stand or a climber. Typically, if you're right-handed, when you set the tree up, you hook up. You'll hook up the lead to where your expected shot is going to be 90 degrees to your left. You okay. know, that's the way you'd set up any any hunting location is where you have to make as minimal movements as possible to take the most obvious shot that will, will present itself. Sure. So basically, you're in a sitting position when you're at rest, when you're just hanging there. Your knees are bent. You know, it's almost like sitting in a chair. And then when you go to take a shot, when you, as soon as you straighten your legs, it kind of 
pushes your body away from the tree, so which actually brings you up, and then you just kind of, you don't have to lean or anything. I mean, it's just like standing on the ground shooting your bow. It's much, much more comfortable and easy to shoot than out of any kind of a tree stand. So you're not leaning at all it sounds like you're no no you're just standing you're just standing up and your butt's resting against a seat and your feet each one of your feet are on a peg a okay. step. so you're solid as a rock okay so you're you're the harness is supporting you under your buttocks and the oh yeah the the strap is securing you to the tree and then your feet are attached to a platform a small platform it sounds like that does a 360 well it's not a platform your feet are just standing on steps right right not not yeah. a a platform necessarily, but it's, there's a place for your feet to to secure themselves to the the tree. Yeah, you got a three points three point stance basically. Okay. Your butt and your both your feet are in solid on solid ground. Okay. And I do I I did need to mention on public lands uh, where you can't use screw ins or you obviously can't put a spike in a tree. I I use Cran Cranford makes a company called Cranford makes strap on steps. Strap ons. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of pricey. They're like ten bucks a pop. But, right. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. But, so you could you could uh, freelance on, on public land like that, where you use these Cranford steps. And, and correct. Uh, and I and on and I w- I have to say this, Jay, on on public land, I don't leave my strap on steps on the tree. On public lands, I always have them with me because otherwise they'll get stolen. Right. Right. Yeah. If you can all the other properties. I leave the steps in the tree. Don't I may take out the bot if I'm. A lot of times I'll have permission on property, and there's a lot of other guys that hunt the property too. It's just somebody lets everybody hunt, so I'll. I may take out the bottom six steps when I'm coming down out of the tree, just so nobody else can access can access my other steps and steal them. Or I'm not worried about anybody hunting my location because the odds of somebody else having a harness is pretty close to zero. But I keep them from stealing my stuff. Right. Well, it's it. You know that that theft thing is always more of a convenience, typically, than a actual de- deliberate. Hey, let's go get all this stuff, kind of thing. So, so the 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 less convenient it becomes, the better off you're going to be as far as getting your stuff not stolen. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Correct. This is uh, this this material, the stuff that the harness is made of. It was in just reading some of your your articles here. You said that it was. Mostly the concept used for arborists to hunt, or not hunt, but to cut trees uh, when they're trimming trees to get up high. And I always, I've i watched arborists before. I'm not an arborist. I've never tried to be an arborist. Uh, but it, I was always fascinated about how quickly and easily they can move around the tree with a harness like that. And they're, you know, certainly when I'm trimming trees around my property and I'm trying to cut cut a limb that's really high with a, with a pole saw, you know, it gets kind of... It's to the point. There's a, a point where it becomes useless, where you need to get higher, and something like this would be extremely useful. Yeah, and that's what New Tribes business. That's what their mother business is. Basically, is they're a recreational tree climbing harness company. So they don't really make these for professional arborists. But you get out west, and a lot of people recreational tree climb. You know, like fascinating out in California and stuff, and and it. And these are rec- it's a recreational tree climbing harness company. But when they when Trophy Line went out of business, who made the saddle, and they didn't go out of business because of the saddle, it was a totally different reason. Uh, it was a safety harness that they made that broke their bank. So, but anyway, when they went out of business, uh, people started going on the internet, harness users looking for something else because there was nothing else other than them. Because the tree sling that I used was out of business long ago, because they couldn't do liability insurance, and when liability insurance became an issue for a store to carry stuff, they didn't carry the sling because it had no liability insurance. Right. So anyway, when New Tribe, they started getting people calling them and saying, "Hey, can you do this or this to this this harness system to make it for hunting?" Because on the recreational tree climbing harness, there was a lot of metal to metal buckles. And obviously, for hunting purposes, you can't have that because there's a noise involved. Right. So they had to go to uh, different types of buckles and get rid of most of the buckles. So there is, you know, there may be some metal parts, but it's hooked. It's a single metal piece, and there's a fabric strap, so there's no metal or no noise associated to it. There's no metal to metal contact on anything. Gotcha. All right, that makes a lot of sense to me as a hunter. Got mm-hmm. it. So the 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 capacity of 
this system that you're familiar with. And I understand yours is completely modified and doesn't actually exist on the market, but the ones that are out there, if you wanted to get used to it, would you start low to get the feel of it first and then gradually move up the tree? Absolutely. Yeah. I, in fact, I would suggest to somebody that purchased one to, if you wanted to put steps like 18 inches off the ground on a tree in your yard and then hook it up, you know, and then shoot it, shoot at a target or else just hook it up where your feet are on the ground. <laughs> I mean, it right. really doesn't make any difference. The steps are kind of nice because then you can figure out the gaps of your steps because the gapping of your steps around the tree is kind of important. If you make your steps too far apart, then you got to make a rigid motion to move around the tree. And the more rigid your motion, the more apt you are to get picked. So, and, and typically when you're up in a tree and you're hunting out of a harness, you see things enveloping. So you see situations in where they're going to occur. So you move around and get in position before that happens. Um, you know, just like you would with anything. But uh, yeah, I would definitely suggest somebody put some, you know, steps around the base of a tree, 18 inches, whatever your comfort level is getting off the ground, maybe 12 inches off the ground. Uh, step up on your steps, tether to the tree and practice practice shooting and definitely practice how high you wrap it around the tree, how high you tether to the tree. Cause that makes all the difference in the world in comfort. Like I said, I tether mine about eye level. If you go by the instructions, they're going to tell you to tether it almost at arm's reach. And that is not comfortable to sit in for a long period of time. Okay. All right. What's the longest you've sat in one of these saddles? From an hour and a half before daylight till probably two hours after dark, wow. waiting for deer to leave at an apple tree. That's, that's I can sit all day in it with no problem. Okay. That's not even an issue. You ever have any issues with like legs falling asleep or things like that, or is there enough relief nope, points? Never. Okay. Nope. Is it? No, because it's not. I mean, if it, the saddle when it was around, it actually the bottom of the seat went down into your thigh area, so it cut off your femur artery mm. and you know, pinched your sciatic nerve a little bit, maybe. Right. Um, so people that were using that would have minor issues, but the new tribe actually has thigh pads. So legs falling asleep would be nothing. And mine, mine does not go down my thigh at all. It stopped. My bottom piece stops right at the crack of my butt. So it's not going down my thigh at all or cutting off any blood flow down my you know, femur artery or anything like that. So, okay. so that's not an issue. I've never had that be an issue. It seems like this would be good for the smaller hunter um, and maybe the medium-sized hunter. Is there any issues with bigger guys, the guys that are 240 plus? Uh, no, I've, I've known guys that are, you know, 350 that have hunted out of the old saddle. Really? I mean, they had 9,600 pound straps. They would support it support your car, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right. But like anything, uh, the heavier you are, the more you're going to struggle with mobility. You know, you're just not that flexible. So, yeah, I think the bigger, the smaller and more in shape you are, that's why I work out every day when I'm home is to stay toned and to stay in shape and keep flexible. Yeah, there's no question that the more flexible you are and more mobile your body is and able to twist and turn and stuff, uh, the the better you're going to be with it. And that's the same with a tree stand or anything. Okay. Very fascinating stuff. Now you're the bow that you're shooting. Are you a, a traditional bow shooter or are you doing? Uh, I'm, uh, I've been on Matthew's hunting pro staff for the, I don't know, 10 years, maybe okay. so I get my bow is from Matthews every year. Okay. All right. So you're, the, you're using compounds, which I think most guys would yes. probably be using would be the compound t- style. Bow. Yeah. And carbon express. I'm on their hunting staff. So I use carbon express, okay. uh, maximum red arrows. Excellent. Well, fascinating. Now the, the shot from the tree that you have to take like any stand, I would assume what adjustments do you need to make? Do you, do you practice from the tree? I never, ever, practice on the ground i practice from the roof of my house okay so i always try to practice where i'm replicating the height that i'm hunting from because uh, i've been bow hunting for 53 years and i used to be a archery tech guy and a buyer at the biggest sports shop in michigan so i'm kind of familiar with shooting forms and if you practice off the ground and i don't care if you're a tree stand hunter or whatever if you practice off the ground where you're standing up you know 
perpendicular to the ground. You got perfect form. Your triangle is exactly the same from your eye to your anchor to your bow hand. Um, and then you go up in a tree and you lean down and then you draw your bow, your eye to your anchor point to your bow hand triangle changes and you'll typically shoot high because your your eye to anchor point has gotten shorter because your head is tilted. That's why so many people shoot high from a tree that have never practiced from a tree. So I sight in and I use the same form from the top of my house. I actually have a platform that I built for my peak of my house mm. that that's where I shoot from. So okay. I'm replicating the exact same form and I sight in from that same form. Okay, so you actually try to replicate the height of your tree stand correct and the and it makes total sense i mean it's geometry really um, yeah that that would now pinpoint a more accurate shot once you're in a perch of some sort right okay excellent how high up are you shooting from it's pretty rare i get below 25 feet to my feet in fact i did my first uh workshop the other day last saturday and it was an infield day and i was taking these guys around to my hunting locations and they were blown away at how i prepared my locations and how each one is a it's a morning spot or an evening spot or early season location or a rut phase location but they were really shocked at at the height that I hunted from, especially my rut phase heights, because again, during the rut, the foliage is down, so you've got to get up a little higher, or you got to have a lot of wood around you for some concealment cover. But yeah, I'm I'm typically I'm typically 25 feet on any type of a rut phase hunting location. Early season, I may be as low as 20. Okay, very good information. And do you adjust your pins that way, and and then just forget about shooting from the ground? Because I would assume that would make you shoot too low. I never shoot. I yeah. never shoot off the ground. Never shoot off the Ever. ground. All right. So everything Ever. is adjusted from the height <laughs> that you're you're typically going to hunt from. Yeah, I I have because I'm on Matthews Pro Staff. I have I have a bow that is sighted in from the ground. So there, it's a rare occasion, but there have been times where the situation called for it, where I hunted from a, a, a man-made, you know, ground blind, blind that I built out of natural surroundings. And I, then I use that bow that's sighted in. I don't recite my bow for that hunt and then recite it again for hunting out of trees. I have a different bow sighted in from the ground. Gotcha. All right. Very, very cool. Can we talk about scent control a little bit and tell me what what you – and tell me if it's important to you or not based off of the style of hunting you're doing. It's great. Yeah. If you're deer hunting, it's critical. I don't care what kind of hunting you're doing. Um, it's, it's very critical. I mean, when you enter a location, you know, if deer are going to cross your route, if they wind you, they, they're, you know, they're going to spook or a lot of times if you make an entry route and you're in heavy cover, deer end up using part of your entry or exit route as, is a travel route. So yeah, or deer downwind to you, winding you, even if it's not the deer you want to kill, if you spook a doe downwind of you and she snorts or blows, you know, that's going to affect the rest of your hunt for that day and possibly for the season. Okay. So, um, yeah, scent control is huge. All right. And how much scent control do you put into your routine? I pay no attention to wind direction. I am a scent control freak. I mean, I watch TV, you know, I'm a activated carbon guy. Activated carbon is the most absorbent substance known to man. Okay. It's in every space suit that NASA has. It's in every chemical warfare suit in the world. Every hospital uses activated carbon pills for oral ingestion of poisoning. It's used to filter every stuff in your, every vehicle has got activated carbon in it someplace. Water softeners use activated carbon. That's so... You know, it's not something Soundlock pulled out of their hat and say, hey, let's use this stuff. It's, it's, uh, if anybody Googled the technology, they'll find out what it, how it works. And when they got sued back, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, they actually had to, in a United States district court, force the Soundlock to prove that it functioned as advertised. They had to send some clothing to Rutgers University where they have a carbon lab scientists that that's all they do is deal with activated carbon and they in the actual final ruling in the court case there was a paragraph in there that said using likely 10,000 times more scent related molecules than the human body could produce in a 24-hour period 
felt lock garments absorbed 96 to 99 percent. Wow. And that's 10,000 times more than the human body could produce in a 24-hour period. That's uh, how absorbent it is. And people that <laughs> people that have used it, they that have gotten winded, typically, not typically, they've, they've either not used it right or they're not doing the whole thing. You know, you watch TV, and even the shows that Suntlock sponsors, those guys got beards, they wear face paint to look cool, they got a logo cap with their hair hanging out, their necks are exposed. Any one of those things, and you can throw your scent control regimen out the window. Right. You have to have your hat on. You have to have the jacket, the pants, rubber boots, gloves. You got to have the drop down face mask covering your mouth and your nose. And then something else, even if somebody does all of that, what most hunters, I do a lot of seminars in Ohio at the deer expos and stuff. And I always ask this question okay, how many of you hunters have had scent lock and been winded? And typically, you know, there's, there's some hands that go up. Okay, now how many of you guys wear a hat with a drop-down face mask? Not many hands go up because most of them just wear a cap, right. you know, and have an exposed face with cool-looking face paint on. They'll make them look like an Indian or something. I don't get it. But then I'll ask them, okay, how many of you guys own a backpack or hunt with a backpack or a fanny pack? And just about everybody's hand goes up. Okay, how many of you guys wash your backpack or fanny pack regularly in scent-free detergent? and store it in an airtight container when you're not using it in a field. Right. No hands go up. So these guys, you can wear your scent lock and hopefully have it properly cared for, and then you're carrying a backpack that you probably get into several times a day with your bare hands to reload it. So you've got this huge human scent wick with you. And then, of course, if you get winded, what are you going to blame it on? Your scent lock didn't work. So most people, not by any fault of their own. They just have never been taught how to properly care for and what to use in conjunction with activated carbon garments. And Sunlock owns the patent on, on activated carbon. That's why nobody else can use it. Right. Gotcha. All right. Very good information. Very, good. very, very good. Excellent, John. That was, that was fascinating. And I'm glad you took us on a, on a educational journey about this whole style of hunting and uh, it's extremely useful, and I think a lot of our listeners who have requested a, a show about this exact topic will be pleased with all the things we just discussed. It's, it opens up a whole new world. I, 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 I can't even begin to say how much more successful hunters would be if they hunted out of this. Now, the tree stand manufacturers, they don't like hearing, hearing this kind of stuff because they sell tree stands, and Typically, every tree has a tree stand. So when a hunter has to have 10 tree stands, not 10 trees, as opposed to having one harness to hunt 40 trees, they don't like that a lot. So, I mean, Trophy Line, when they were around and they went through the TMA deal, which TMA is controlled by tree stand manufacturers, they, they've struggled with some of the owners of the tree stand manufacturers because they really didn't want them in the business. Right, right. Wow. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating business. Fascinating uh, style of hunting that, that we don't see a lot of, but it seems like it has its advantages for sure. Very cool. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. So, John, I asked you to bring us on a memorable deer hunt earlier before the, we got into the, the talk, and I was wondering if you could take us on a, on a deer hunt with you somewhere. I don't know where we're going, sure. but um, where, it, where are we going to go? Take, I'm going to take you to Michigan. Okay. Because I, I'm, I, uh, I've written three books, and I've produced four instructional bow hunting DVDs. And um, so I'm a pressured hunter guy. You know, I go to Kansas and Iowa when I want to kill a really easy deer during Michigan's gun season. That's where I go to, you know, there are freebies out there, 140 inches are freebies. So, okay. But in Michigan, it's a struggle to kill a two-year-old in most places. So it, this is a Michigan hunt. It was 2004, and it was Election Day. So I don't know what the election day was. It was November, second Tuesday in November. Mm -hmm. And I voted up at home, and then I drove down to Kalamazoo area, which was probably a two-and-a-half-hour drive. And I got there and eh, noonish maybe, and I got in my tree, and I was this was going to be a midday evening hunt. And it was in an, a relatively tight funnel, and there was a, it was a primary scrape area at an apple tree. And there was like three scrapes, but the apples were all gone. 
they were had already all dropped and they had been consumed, but it was still a pass through area. And that's one thing that sure bucks do is, you know, there was a lot of doe activity there for the last two months. And even though there's no apples and not a lot of doe activity there at the moment, you know, the does are still passing through there and the bucks are still checking it. They don't look in the tree and say, Hey, Oh, there's no apples. There's not going to be any does here anymore. They don't have that kind of a thought process. Right. So they're just going off memory. Does have been here. I'm checking it and they're still working the scrapes. And I had this monster buck come in, and I thought he was going to come in to the actual scrapes and work it. So I'm I'm set up on the actual scrapes, and I'm on the downwind side of the scrapes. Mm. And again, I don't pay attention to wind direction, but I had set up on the south side of the scrape area. And the reason I hunted it this day is because a lot of times a big buck, and I knew this big buck was in the area, a lot of times a big buck will come in and he'll scent check a scrape area from downwind. So by setting up 15, 20 yards on the downwind side of the scrapes, that way if he's 30, 40 yards from the scrapes on the downwind side to scent check him, he's still within my comfortable shooting distance of 15 to 20 yards. So I'm set, set up, you know, downwind of these scrapes and sure as sure as crap i thought he was going to come into him the way he was walking and then he kind of turned and he started making a circle around him so i swung around the tree so now my body is actually my back is facing the scrapes so i i went about 90 degrees around the tree to the side and by the time i got around he went through my shooting lane that i had that direction mm. so i swung back over to where I was initially, where I've got, you know, now I can shoot to the scrapes. And I kind of just sat there and the foliage is down because it's kind of, it's November. Right. And I'm watching him and he swings around and he comes around through the brush and he stops right at the base of my tree. I mean, he is straight down and he's just sniffing the air. And he, you know, obviously there hadn't been any does come through there that aroused his uh, attention or interest so he he turned around and he went exactly back in the same route that he came in from which is relatively common when they're sun checking right. so i as he's going back around i swung back around the tree again and then when he went through that same he went through the same lane that he'd passed through where i didn't get the shot because he'd already went through it he went through that same lane again and i was ready that time he got in the middle of the lane and i meh, stopped him at full draw and, and i shot him it was a 154 inch 10 point beautiful but with the, with the without the saddle there's no way i would have done that okay without right. the sling i always call it saddle because that's what everybody knows but it was actually with the sling gotcha very with cool. the tree stand, I'd have never been able to shoot that deer. So there was an, an advantage. You, you feel like that was that was your uh, your magic formula. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right. Very nice. All right. I have ten rapid fire questions for you. And oh, can I say something real quick? Absolutely. Um, there is a site that is strictly for harness users, and it's called SaddleHunter dot com. Okay. So if anybody wants to learn or talk to people that have used these things for quite a while. Everybody on this site, they're real friendly. They've all used the harness, some sort of a harness system. So it's just saddlehunter.com. Okay. Okay. Rapid fire. All right. Very good. Yeah. 10 rapid fire questions. I didn't prep you for these and they come out a little better when I don't. So I'm going to run through the list here and it's more just opinion stuff. All right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Scent control. Okay. What's the one thing that you can't hunt without? If you leave it at home, it drives you crazy because you don't have it with you. My sling. Your sling, all right. And my bow, either one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Pet peeve. Doesn't have to be with hunting? Nope. It can just be a, in general. Stupidity. People's stupidity. Okay. God, that's crude. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to change your answer? <laughs> uh, No, it's true. Okay. I, I'm, I'm a, I like telling the truth. I, I run into... I run into so many hunters that just when they tell me how they hunt and it just blows my mind that you can make suggestions and they're just not open. You know, to me, if if somebody thinks they knows everything, uh, stagnate, stagnation sets in, you know, you sure. gotta always keep your mind open for learning and some people are just stupid and they're closed minded. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's see how, how old are you today, John? 66. You're 66. What would you tell the 33-year-old John Eberhardt, Eberhardt, knowing what you know today? I 
I don't think I'd tell him anything. I was very happy with the way he did things. Okay. Excellent. I was very happy with his learning process and yeah. Awesome. Well, maybe that's... different maybe different with the kids, but uh as far as hunting, nothing with my family. Right. I changed a few things maybe. All right, very cool. Good answer. All right, you're let's see. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world and a stranger comes up to you and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? I'm a sales rep in the hunting industry. Excellent. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a Schwann's egg pe- egg and bacon pizza. Mm, it's sounds... called a breakfast single. It's just on the <laughs> microwave for two minutes and eat it. <laughs> so, sounds pretty good, actually. All right. All right. You can have your own billboard on the side of a highway anywhere in the country. It's a blank canvas. What would you put on it? Well, I'd advertise my new workshops. <laughs> which I just started doing. Of course, doing, of so. course. Excellent. All right. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Miles Keller. Miles Keller. And on the hunting end, Miles Keller is the only person in the hunting industry I even respect at all, to be perfectly frank about it. Okay. Right. I, I I have zero respect for any TV guys. Okay. What's a day in your life typically look like? I shouldn't say zero, very little. <laughs> what does a day in my life typically look like? Right. Uh happy. I'm very, I feel very fortunate to have Mm -hmm. been born in this country with our freedoms and I live on a lake. I can go fishing whenever I want. I can go and do things whenever I want. And I know I've met a lot of other people here from Europe and Africa, South Africa, and uh, we are the most free country in the world and we have the fewest regulations. And I'm just happy to live in America and be free. Okay. Are you a early riser typically? Depends on what you mean by early. All right. <laughs> I go to bed usually by midnight and I'm usually up by six or seven. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. And then let's change it around. It's deer season. What's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? Uh, it depends on the time of season. Rut early. I don't hunt much during October other than the first four or five days of bow season, early season. And then I key most of my time on the rut phases so um, early season, my typical day would be hunting morning and evening. Uh, rut, rut phase, a typical day would be getting up extremely early, being in my tree an hour and a half before daylight and settled in by then, and possibly hunting all day or at least till till midday. You know, just it's like the playoffs in sports. That's when you get serious. And right. so my typical day is very busy and, and tiring during the rut phases. Gotcha. Very, very good. John, if people listening to the show – want more information if they're curious and they need some more information beyond what we are able to deliver on this podcast where can we find more information uh, i have a website and it can be reached at either www.deer that's d-e-e-r dash j-o-h-n dot net or at eberhart's whitetail workshop dot com and i am doing two-day whitetail workshops, one day in the field going over property that I've hunted for quite a few years, looking at all my stand locations, the why, where, and when of each one. And uh, the second day is an all-day seminar at uh, the largest sporting goods store in Michigan. Very, very good. Excellent. Well, John, this has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on our show. And I can't sure. tell you how much I appreciate you going into detail about the saddle hunting thing. It's been a topic of conversation as we've had many requests over the the years to, hey, can you go talk about this? And your name was the one that, that came up first and uh, you're, you're extremely knowledgeable. So thank you very much for spending some time with us explaining how that all works. You bet, Jay. It was my pleasure. Good luck to everybody this fall. Thank you to John Eberhardt for joining us on the Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast. The methodology that he uses is perhaps one of the most unique styles of hunting that I've heard of. It seems like it would be extremely effective, but I believe that there is a learning curve. And I think there's a there's an adaptability feature where you, it's going to take you some time to get used to the style of hunting. A tree stand is forgiving and certainly puts you in many similar aspects, but John says that if you really want to do it right, the harness, something you may want to explore. I don't think it's for everybody. I'm not sure it's even for me, but it's very intriguing. And because we had so many listeners write in and say that they would like some more information on how to hunt the saddle with this tree stand harness, 
we had to go find somebody, and John Eberhart was that guy. And Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? Yeah, I do, Jay, and it's going to uh, take me back to when I first started getting knowledge of how to get a hold of hunting land and where to go to places to execute the landowners. And I'm going to go into my personal bag of tricks here and, and, and share something that I do if I'm in a bind and I need a place to hunt, you know. The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morris's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morrisessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morris's Sporting Goods. Most, I want to say 99% of farmers have this one particular restaurant either within a county or a couple cities over that they all like to congregate to to have breakfast. It's where they can sit down and cut up and have fun with each other. And, and it seems like if you, if you know a, a few farmers or at least one farmer that may catch that breakfast, that, that's somewhere where you can capitalize on a piece of property to hunt on. You, you start making the effort to show up there for breakfast. Either it's a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning if you're off work Tuesday or Wednesday or any day of the week that you're off work or just a day that you don't have nothing going on and you say, hey, I need to go to this particular restaurant, sit down, have breakfast with these farmers and walk in and introduce yourself and sit down with them. Hmm. Say, hey, you guys care if I join you for breakfast? And they're going to say, no, not one bit. You know, who are you? What, what, you know, they're going to want to know about you. Right. You've made the effort to show up there and you made the attempt to sit down with them. That's going to spark their interest. You know, it's not very often that somebody walks into their breakfast at their congregation meeting area uh, and asks to sit down with them because it's usually a clique of 8 to 15 guys that just catch up, you know, maybe it's once or twice a week or maybe it's even every day. So just go ahead and sit down and introduce yourself and tell them, you know, hey, you're, you're a bow hunter and, you know, and maybe take a couple pictures with you or if you got them on your phone, get them out and show them to them. And, and let them know that you're, you're kind of interested in, in finding a place to, to hunt on. And if you continue to show up to that breakfast meeting or a congregation area, they're going to they're gonna start to recognize you and they're going to learn who you are. And they're going to build a personal trust at breakfast that, that's going to lead into, you know, crop damage. They're going to get start talking about that. And that, that, that's your opportunity when they start talking about deer or tearing the heck out of their soybeans or their cornfields or their hay fields. You know, you just say, hey, I'm... I, I could be the guy to go in there and, and kill off a few of them deer for you and maybe help out your yields. And, you know, don't just run in there and say, hey, can I hunt your place? You know, not introduce yourself or get to know them because it's not going to work. Get to know them a little bit. Build a little trust with them. And maybe if you got a couple that you like and you know that they got a piece of property you could you could possibly hunt on, maybe buy their breakfast. Just use that, that morning meeting that there's a group of friends or buddies or, you know, uh, fellow farmers. Go in there and sit down and, and try to capitalize on, on a piece of property with that route. That's, That's my Chubby Time tip of the week, Jay. Great tip, man. I was just gonna I was just about to ask you how many people show up and do that and where you go as a farmer to hang out. Probably not too many. No, that it don't it doesn't happen very often, but usually when it does, there's always somebody there that's looking for somebody to hunt a farm that they don't necessarily live on. That that's something I'm picking up on that if they don't live there they're it's not that they don't care, but they're a little more lenient on what happens there. Right. So if they own a couple farms, you know, and they got one down the road from their house, and the odds are you're going to get permission to hunt that farm because, you know, for one, they, they got crop damage. Right. Number two, they visually can't see you pulling it out and you're not, you know, an aggravation to them. Right. And, uh, you know, farmers like to have people on their land, uh, not not necessarily just for hunting, but for the aspect of trespassers and they, they almost n- – need a guy to give them some information, some feedback on what's going on on their piece of land down the road. Right. That's a a great tip. Very good tip of the week. Thank you very much for that, my friend. And I'd like to thank Morse's Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. And I'd really like to thank our other sponsors, Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, the Horny Buck Seed Company, and the Covert Scouting Cameras. We truly believe in each and every one of these products and Morse's Sporting Goods it's one of my favorite places on the planet, and the people there are some of my best friends. And without the help of those four sponsors, this show doesn't happen. If you would like to participate, in addition to the sponsors we have on this program, you can contribute your own funds. You can help us keep the lights on. We do have a growing budget. It costs more to produce shows than it ever has. And with your help, we'll be able to continue to bring you some of the best deer hunting knowledge that we can uncover from the, some of the best deer hunters on the face of the planet. 
So again, if you'd like to contribute, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. So Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here on the microphone with me? You can look me up, facebook.com forward slash chubby times outdoors. You can shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can also look me up on Instagram at chasing antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, you can always follow us on Facebook and facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. If you'd like to get your picture of your, the giant buck that you shot featured on the page, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and all the instructions will be right there for you. Uh, we don't post every buck that gets sent in. In fact, a lot of times they're just they're not, they are not then meet the criteria. And the criteria, it's not necessarily how big the buck is. But we do want to see a picture of you with your buck, uh, preferably in the field or a, a wall mount. But we don't just post pictures of the buck. We want pictures of you and the buck um, because it ties that human aspect of hunting together with the wild. And without that, uh, you know, it's just, just half of the story. So um, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and all the information is right there. If you are an iTunes user, please leave us a review. We could use as many reviews as we can get. If you love the show, leave us a five star and subscribe to this, sh- this show on iTunes. If you're an iTunes user, we have been busy posting our shows to YouTube because we have that feature now where we can get the full length version of this show on YouTube. Even though it's a video platform, it actually is converting our audio to a video so you can listen to it there, which is great because sometimes you can't get, I mean, you might not be an iTunes user. But you can always tap into YouTube and get our channel and all of our good, great interviews over there. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Instagram, instagram.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You can see the theme there. And I think that is pretty much everywhere we are at. A whole lot of Big Buck. Big Buck, Big Buck, everywhere a Big Buck. I'm Dusty Phillips. And I'm Jay Scott. And this is another great episode of the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. 